Sunday is that special time for us to get together and study the Word of God. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning for our presentation of Give Me the Bible. So go get your Bible, sit down, and let's study together from the pages of God's eternal Word right here on Give Me the Bible. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Have you ever stopped to think about the worst thing you could ever do in your life? You know, too often in life, we perhaps are guilty of maybe doing certain things and maybe we didn't intentionally do wrong, but it turned out to be one of the worst things that we could have ever done in life. Maybe you went out and purchased something and then after you got it home, you thought, boy, that's the worst thing in the world I've ever done. I bought that new car, I didn't need it, and it turned out to be a lemon. Uh, or maybe you bought a house and then you determined that you didn't like the layout like you thought you would. <laughs> well, you know what? In life, we all make many, many mistakes, don't we? We do. We all sin, by the way. In the book of Romans 3.23, the Apostle Paul said that, that we, we do all sin and we make mistakes. We err. John went on to say that if we don't admit the fact that we sin, we lie and we do not the truth and we even make God out to be a liar. What is the worst thing you have ever done in your life? That's the question that our panelists are going to entertain here this morning. And we go, first of all, uh, to Brother Perry Cowan. Perry? Dad, I'm going to suggest that one of the worst things that any of us could ever do is to leave God out of our plans. We make plans every day. And this is a major, a major mistake that so often people make. You know, the book of James, the fourth chapter says, come now you who say today or tomorrow we'll go to such and such a city and we'll spend the year there, we'll buy and sell and make a profit. And he said, you don't know what's gonna to happen tomorrow. You don't know what, uh, what, what's gonna take place. What is your life? He said, it's, it's like a vapor that's here just for a little while and then it, it's vanished away. And have you made plans for that? If the Lord wills, we should do this, we should do that. We need to include the Lord in any plan that we make. Did you, before you left your room this morning, when you got out of bed, before you uh, went to work or wherever it was you might be going during the day, did you go to your Heavenly Father in prayer? And if you didn't, if you didn't, was it just your plan to try to make it through the day without him in your plans, without any help, without any guidance from the Lord God? Or did you just forget? Forget to include him in your plans. That is a major mistake that so many people make. They forget and leave God out of their plans. There's a story in Genesis chapter 28 about uh, Jacob and a vow that he made to God and after he made that vow, he went off and he lived some 20 years or so in, in another part of the country, and he never did go back until God appeared to him and said, look, I want you to go back to Bethel. You go back and remember the vow that you made because it's better uh, not to make a vow than to make a vow and not keep it. Remember the things that we vowed to do when we obeyed God. We need to remember that anytime we submit ourselves to God, we've made a vow to Him that we're going to uh, uh, do His will. We're going to seek to do His work. Uh, always thank God. Thank God for His bountifulness. Thank God for the blessings that you enjoy every day. Let us never forget what He has done for us. You know, the Bible says that if we'll confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Do you believe he forgives your sins? Do you really believe that he does? If you don't, why do you bother to ask him? And if you do, do you tell him thank you for forgiving? You know, oftentimes we ask, Lord, please forgive our sins. 
but very seldom do we say, thank you, Father, that you have forgiven us, and we need to certainly be thankful for that. Dan? Well, Perry, thank you this morning, and uh, we hope that all of you are benefiting from our program this morning. You know, not only do people often neglect God, but they neglect so many other things in life. And we're happy to have Brother Kerry Clark with us this morning from the Central Church of Christ over in Athens, Texas. And uh, Kerry, I want you to help us uh, understand even more fully the importance of the Church of Jesus Christ and why we should not neglect it. Well, you know, Dan, you're exactly right. When you stop and think about it, one of the things that people do is they do neglect the church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he that is faithful that promised and let us consider one another to provoke one another to love and to good works. Now listen carefully to verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. He says in verse 27 or verse 26, if we sin willfully. Friends, the Bible tells us that it is a willful sin for us to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. You know, when you stop and think about it, God actually knows us better than we know ourselves. You remember Jeremiah said in Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse number 23, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. God knew that we needed to assemble together. God recognized that, as a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 20, in verse number 7, we find the church in the first century met every Lord's Day, every first day of the week, they met together. And they, they, they had a communion together. Uh, it's interesting, and I encourage you to do this if you have the time, to go through your Bible and just notice the number of times that Jesus touched people. You know, with this pandemic going on, we've been told we've got to distance it from each other and things, and we've lost that human touch, and it's vitally important. In Matthew chapter 8, in verse number 3, Jesus touched a leper. In Matthew chapter 8, in verse number 15, he touched the hand of Peter's mother-in-law. We could go on and on with these examples. God knows that we need to assemble together and you know, if we were to neglect our children, criminal charges could be brought against us. If we neglect our parents, if they're elderly, they can actually bring charges against us. If we were a Christian, or if you're a Christian this morning, if you're forsaking the assembly, if you're neglecting the church, is God going to bring charges against you? One of the greatest sins that we commit is neglecting the assembling of ourselves together. Brother Dan. Well, Carrie, thank you. And you're right when you said that too often times we distance ourselves from each other in the body of Christ. And that's a terrible thing. You know, the church is so important, the church of Jesus. But why are there so many differing religious bodies? We have a DVD that we're going to ask you to write for or call for. Uh, it's simply entitled, Why Are There So Many Different Churches? And which one should we be thankful for? So we hope that you'll call us at the 800 number that we'll be appearing throughout today's telecast. We want to go to Joe Hancock right now. And Joe, uh, I know that in life, uh, sometimes our parents say, don't you run with the wrong crowd. Yeah, how could they get to be a crowd if people are not running with them? <laughs> No, Dan's, Dan's got a great point. One of the worst things we can ever do is associate ourselves or, or, or join with questionable associations or, or the wrong crowd, as Dan put it. You know, there's so many sins that can be made or can be done in a day's time, and there are folks out there committing them hand over fist all day long. And God's people need not be a part of such kind of a lifestyle. 
Uh, I'm going to go with uh, a couple of scripture passages here this morning. If you have your Bibles, the well, first place we're going to stop is 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul talks about some, some folks that, that we don't need to be associated with and the reasons why. Beginning in verse 14 of 2 Corinthians 6, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? Or what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? See, those are two diametrically opposed groups of people, believers, disbelievers, uh, Christ, the, the devil. Uh, in verse 16, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, then he quotes Ezekiel. I will dwell among them and, and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Then he quotes from Isaiah. Uh, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Chapter 7, verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. If we're running with the wrong crowd, the wrong people, the wrong lifestyle of folks, then there's no way to cleanse ourselves in holiness. It just doesn't happen because we continue to sin again and again and again. There's another passage over in Ephesians chapter 5, and I'll just read a portion of that beginning at verse 8. Ephesians 5, verse 8. For you were once darkness, now you were children of light. Walk as children of light. In other words, live as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Then down in verse 15, he says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. It is is plain through the New Testament Scripture that the will of the Lord is that we be Christ-like, that we, that we combine ourselves and pair ourselves and associate ourselves with people who desire to be Christ-like, the church. Uh, I was telling the folks last night in, in uh, Hallsville Church, uh, the assembly, one of my most favorite places to be is around my Christian brothers and sisters, regardless of what we're doing. That's the crowd we need to run with, Dan, not with questionable associations. God's not pleased with that. Well, Joe, that should tell all of us something this morning. That, uh, you know, if you run with the turkeys, you'll never soar with the eagles. <laughs> and how true. By the way, we're not talking about the Philadelphia Eagles either. But uh, anyway, we want to go a little bit further here, and we're going to call on Chris Grota. And Chris, I think one of the biggest mistakes that all of us make in life, and certainly uh, one of the worst things that we could possibly do, is what? Dan will answer that question by talking about how that some Christians think that they are exempt from problems. That's one of the worst things that you can do in life is think that, you're, that you don't have any problems as a New Testament Christian. And I know that some people think going into Christianity that life's going to be all peaches and cream. It simply isn't that way. Conversely, there are people who, once they experience problems, have a kind of a woe is me mentality. And while there are others that have kind of a akuna matata. You remember Timon and Pumbaa's song on Lion King? Kind of a problem-free philosophy? Well, that's not reality either. You know, the Bible is full of problems. So David has uh, a list of problems in the Psalm. Psalm 51, he's distressed by his choices. He's distressed by his enemies in Psalm 54. Go to Acts chapter 6 and you'll see the Grecian widows lodging a complaint because they're being neglected in the daily distribution of food. There's doctrinal problems uh, galore at the church of Corinth. Uh, Paul has to write Philemon regarding accepting his slave Onesimus back. Um, <clears throat> Philippians uh, has to address Iota and Syntyche who are two sisters in Christ that are at odds with one another and they have to come back together. There's lots of problems but what can a Christian do to maybe have some coping strategies with their problems? Well, number one, we need to have the right focus, and that is we need to have a kingdom focus, a kingdom first focus. Matthew 6, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then whatever you need will be added unto you. Secondly, we need to have the right practice. That is the practice of prayer. Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 6, not to be overcome by anxiety, but with anxiety, go to God in prayer with thanksgiving. Let your request 
be made known unto God. And then number three, we need to have the right choice. You look at Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10, and Mary chose that good part because she chose to hear the preaching of the, of the word of the Lord versus Martha, who was busy about uh, doing things regarding service in the household. And then number four, we need to have the right perspective on God. Ephesians 3 and verse number 20 tells us that our God is bigger than our problems. He that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, that is our God. And so with the right focus, that is on the kingdom of God, with the right practice, the practice of prayer, with the right choice of staying in his word, and with the right perspective on the glory and the bigness of our God, we can overcome our problems and we can turn our problems into opportunities and possibilities. That's realistic. Back to you, Dan. And Chris, to your words, I can say a hearty amen and amen. So be it. And how true that really, really is. Well, we're happy to have with us today from Hope, Arkansas, uh, the Barry Haynes. And uh, Barry, I know that a lot of people commit wrong and a lot of people do bad things and they look back on their life with great remorse. But what to you from your vantage point would be the worst thing that anyone could do? You know, one of the worst things that we can do is to advance ourselves at the expense and the detriment of others. And I think that's a problem that we have in our modern society today. Now, we don't say it that way. We don't say, well, I'm just going to step over anybody to get what I want. But we say it in things like, don't let anyone else keep you from your dreams. And we, we say things like, uh, uh, don't let anybody tell you what you can't do. And what we're really saying is, is my happiness is paramount and it doesn't matter what I have to do to others to get it. And because of that, we see a lot of misery in our world. It's not just a modern problem, however. We see it back in the Old Testament in the book of Amos. Amos condemns the Israelites there for their practices in chapter 8. He talks about how they have created a society that makes the bushel smaller and the shekel bigger. In other words, everything is, is costing more and you're getting less. Have you noticed that before? You go to buy something and what used to seem like it would fill the package now is half empty and it's twice as much as it used to be. It's because they were exploiting people. They could do it. They could get away with it. And he compares them in verse 6. He says, They buy the helpless for money and the needy for a pair of sandals so that we may sell the refuse of the wheat. In other words, they were willing to sell out their own countrymen to have a cheap pair of, of sandals. Are we doing the same thing today? Are we so concerned about having cheap products that we're not afraid of who gets exploited in order to make them? We need to consider that the way to the top is not stepping on others, that you don't benefit, you don't, gain, you don't gain anything when you destroy others to get what you want. Because in the essence, when you do so, you'll stand in judgment before God. You know, James talks about that in James chapter 5 and verses 4 through 6. He says those, Behold the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and have been withheld by you cry out against you. And that outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the Lord of hosts. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts to the day of slaughter. You condemn and put to death the righteous, and he does not resist you. Here James is condemning those people who had made their life easy and luxurious by mistreating all the people that were around them. And he says, God's going to see what you do and stand in judgment of you. You see, if we climb our way to the top by stepping on everyone else when we get there, we'll find a lonely existence, and the only person coming for us is trying to take us down. But rather, if we through love serve one another, if we think of others more than we think of ourselves, we'll find ourselves surrounded by grateful people who care about us. But more importantly, we'll be rewarded by a great God who sees what we have done and is, is, sees what we've done and rewards us for it. And Barry, that is the most important thing, isn't it? It really, really is. I hope you're digesting what we're saying here on this telecast this morning, and I hope that it is, serves as something that's very beneficial to you as you recall in your own life uh, ways that you can do better and not commit some of those things. You know, if you don't learn, history is destined to repeat itself. One of the absolute, and no doubt the absolute worst thing in the world that an individual can do is the very thing 
that really Brother Jerry Munholland is going to address at this point. So please listen up. If you haven't been listening intently, please listen right now. Jerry. Thank you, Dan. I know we've, we have discussed several things which uh, are, are fall into the list of some of the worst things that we can do. But I want to turn to Acts chapter 2 and, and talk about what would be absolutely one of the worst things that you could do in this life. In Acts chapter 2, we know that that's Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. Several weeks before, Jesus had been crucified. And now the crowd had gathered there on Pentecost, and Peter takes occasion to preach to them about this. He said in verse 36 of Acts chapter 2, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made this same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And I'm sure the crowd would be thinking that putting to death the one that God anointed as both Lord and Christ, that would be the absolutely worst thing they could ever do in their life. But Peter says, no, that's not the worst thing. Not putting Jesus to death on the cross is not the worst thing. I, surely they had several weeks of regret with that weight upon their shoulder and their conscience. We have crucified the Christ. Listen to what Peter said. When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. They were cut to their heart, to the very depths of their heart, and said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter gives this answer. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. He continues on in verse 40 and says, save yourselves from this wicked generation. Save yourself. Save yourself from the burden of sin and save yourself from the penalty of sin. Save yourself from the presence of sin eventually when we go to heaven. You see, the absolutely worst thing was found in this next verse. It's a good thing and it's a worst thing. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day were added unto them 3,000 souls. Absolutely best thing they could do is to receive his word and be baptized, to make Jesus Lord and Savior of their life. But the absolutely worst thing they could do is to reject him as Lord and Savior, to leave that time and say, no, Peter, I don't think I will. I don't think I will receive your word. I don't think I will be baptized. I don't think I want my sins to be forgiven. I don't think I want to go to heaven. You may ask yourself the question, is there anything worse than to go to hell for all eternity? And I would say, yes, there is. What's worse than going to hell for all eternity is taking your family with you. Please make a decision to become a Christian, to repent and be baptized, to have Jesus as your Savior, and not spend eternity in hell. Now back to you, Dan. Well, Brother Jerry, that's so true, isn't it? Because we have numerous examples in the Bible of where people delayed their obedience and because of it, they ended up dying out of Christ and were lost. I think about a king by the name of Agrippa. And the Bible says that the apostle Paul reasoned with him. He discussed the word of God with him. He knew what he should have done. But he said to Paul, almost, almost, Thou persuadest me to be a Christian. But you know what? Almost is to be lost. Paul not only spoke to kings, he spoke to governors. He spoke to one by the name of Felix. He reasoned with him about righteousness and temperance and the judgment to come. And in those moments of reasoning together with him, the Bible says that Felix said, when there is a more convenient season, I'll call for you. But we never have record in the Word of God where the convenient season ever came or where Paul ever discussed it with him again. But he waited until it was too late. And as Brother Jerry said, that is absolutely the worst thing in the world you could do. Do you know you're only a heartbeat away from God? God could seal your eternity in one moment, one breath. That's why it's important for us to serve God and give attention not only to the worst things that we probably could have done, 
but focus on the one thing that could be the best thing that you could ever do, and that's to become a Christian. We hope you'll do that today. You can call the 800 number. We'll be happy to assist you in your steps of obedience to Christ and knowing that someday heaven can be your home. I'm Dan Manuel, and I've served this morning as your moderator and host right here on Give Me the Bible. And uh, we hope that you'll tune in next week at the same time, same station, for another presentation of Give Me, Give Me the Bible. Sing the sweetest song of all.